thank you all for joining us here for our third seminar. Uh, we got Captain Pat Price of the Daymaker here to talk a little bit about offshore fishing. He's got some dredges and some of his combos that he uses here. Um, thank you all, to all of you guys who tuned in to our Penn Tackle Shop series live on um, Pat's Facebook last night and our Instagram. Uh, for those of you who were not able to check it out last night, it is saved on his Facebook, our Facebook, as well as on our Instagram. So you can go ahead and check that out. We've got our next seminar next Thursday right here in the Snooked Up parking lot at 5.30 p.m. with our pen rep, Gary Zeebman, who's going to go into a lot more of uh, the details behind all the pen tackle that Pat uses and that we use aboard the Snooked Up charter boat and all the reels that we've got inside the shop to get you ready for the tent sale here on the 19th. But without further ado, we'll hand it off here to Pat. We'll just talk to you. So, as far as uh, fishing this time of year, uh, I, I like to stay pretty versatile on my boat. We do a lot of trolling, we do a lot of kite fishing, we do a lot of bottom fishing. There's a lot of times where we do all that in the same day uh, throughout the course of the day and kind of break up the monotony if it's slow or even if fishing's good. And I have people that are in come out of town that say they only wanted to catch sailfish but have never experienced bottom fishing before. Even if the season's closed for grouper in January, We'll try to catch them a grouper and they get a feel for that and they want to come back in May or June. So it's part of a little bit of a business strategy to let them know what we have to offer here, which is a, a, a great ecosystem between inshore and offshore as far as fishing is concerned. Um, and a lot of people really don't even realize that are from out of town, you know, what the other fish fight like and the experience involved with that. So as far as trolling, we're going to start off with that. Um, I, I keep it pretty simple on my boat as far as I'm concerned, um, doing it all by myself, uh, mostly with novice anglers. Um, I do try to encourage people to learn how to hook their own fish. Some people want to do it, other people want to sit in the sun and drink beer and be away from the rods, which is not very timely for trying to hook a dolphin or a sail when we get those bites. If you're pulling lures for tunas or wahoos or kings on planers and stuff like that, that's fine. But as far as dolphins and sails and bait fishing, somebody has to be there to present the bait to the fish when you get a bite. Otherwise, your hookup ratio is going to go in the toilet, for lack of a better term. Um, and, and as far as uh, you know, the dolphin and sail fishing, I, I tell everybody that comes on the boat, we treat that boat the same way as far as feeding the fish. So if we're pulling a spread of values, 
I pull five values, um, sometimes with color, mostly naked, um, with circle hooks this time of year. We'll fish a, a quarter ounce or a three eighth ounce uh, chin weight. Um, and it's rigged with a circle hook on the head with what's called a ringer swivel. A ringer swivel is a, a, a swivel that's got a O ring on it. So the hook goes in the O ring, but the swivel allows 360 degrees of rotation for the circle hook. So it increases your hook up ratio allowing that hook to spin freely when you get a bite and you're going to slowly set the hook. Um, when a fish comes into the spread, if we can't see it beforehand, uh, say we're looking into the sun, perfect example, I'm trolling to the west and the flat line pops out and I didn't see it. Unless line's just ripping off the reel, we're going to go always assume it's a dolphin or a sail this time of year. And what we're going to do when that happens is we're going to go ahead and throw it in a free school and we're going to let the bait go. And the reason why we do that, we want to billfish when they come into the spread, uh, typically they're going to smack your bait, right? They're going to stun it with their bill. But when they do that, they don't expect it to keep swimming away at six knots. So what we're trying to do is replicate a natural scenario. And they come in and they smack it with their bill. We want to see that bait kind of fall flutter like it's stunned, maybe it's dead, maybe it's been knocked out, whatever the case may be. When that happens, right, the fish smacks it with its bill, now you're free spooling and the bait's sinking, a sail is going to grab the bait sideways and they're going to do what we call dog boning. They're going to bite until they can spin it head first. All billfish swallow their prey head first. Now here's the caveat, if your hook is on the front of the head of your value, right, that's where our circle hook is. If you have any resistance on your line as you're feeding it with your thumb or your drag lever is not pushed all the way in the free spool, when they're sitting and trying to spin it and you're pulling it the other way, one of two things happens. Either you get what's called a sancocho, which is just the head and the hook back, or you pull the whole bait out and the fish loses interest, right? Or Maybe uh, as he's getting it in, you have a little too much thumb pressure and he gets stuck with the hook and then he just lets the whole thing down and swims away. So it's a lot of people, as far as feeding a fish, or everybody's worried about backlashing, right? It's really, it's, it's something you just kind of have to get over with practice. Um, and you have to understand that you can lose a couple fish in the process. But in order to become a better angler bait fishing, for dolphins and sails, you have to get in the process and the routine of feeding fish without a clicker on. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, and and the, the most important thing that I try to teach people when they're learning to do it is if you can feel the fish pulling the line off, he can feel you. So if you feel him pulling, there's too much tension. You've got too much thumb tension, right? And, and he can feel you, and that's where your bait's going to separate or they're not going to be able to swallow the bait whole properly. So. There's a couple things you can do when you're free spooling. Um, I actually use no thumb at all, right? But I'll hold, I'll move my rod tip position to create an angle for the line coming off. Also figuring you have some wind that's blowing the belly. You also have the movement of the boat. So once water and uh, line gets into the water and slack line gets into the water, a lot of times if you're in full free spool, right? You got line dumped in the water. What's pulling the line off the reel is actually the water, the, the wash from the boat, not the fish itself. The fish will actually pause itself while it's eating. So what's what's happening while he's sitting there eating a lot of times and taking that brief second to swallow the bait and spin it around, they're not moving a whole lot. And it's the momentum of the boat that's pulling the line. But if you have too much thumb and your line, say, entering the boat 20 feet behind the water, or, your line is entering the water 20 feet behind the boat, and that's just too much. You want it to kind of come off the rod tip and fall in the water, right? So the least amount of resistance as possible is very important. This same thing works for dolphins, and it's very important for dolphins, all right? We, I've caught a lot of dolphins in my lifetime, and I've caught 15-pound dolphins that have three-pound dolphins inside of them. What's, what's with the dolphins that are inside of them? They're always whole, right? I've caught dolphins that have houndfish in them, values in them. Everything that's in them is whole. The only time I've ever caught mahis with a half a bait or any kind of piece of bait is when I throw chunks in the water. So they, too, swallow everything whole. That being said, if we're trying to kill this fish for dinner, we don't mind if we get hooked, right? So we want to feed the fish the bait. We 
want to let it swallow it. You know, with circle hooks or even J hooks, I do everything the same now, even if we fish a big spread. We just feed the fish a count of seven or eight, lock it up slowly, and slowly take a turn or two with the handle. I don't crank fast, we don't set the hook, we don't do any of that. You got the momentum of the boat, all the hooks are chemically sharpened down. There's no reason to set a hook, but you don't want to set a hook with a circle hook. You just want everything to slowly and naturally come tight together with the movement of the boat and the fish go in a different direction. We do have some scenarios, dolphins like to eat two or three baits, they're aggressive, they'll eat two or three baits. So I'll go to feed a fish and I can see when I start to slowly crank the line up that I've got belly in my line, he's coming back to eat another bait. So to try to prevent that from happening, I'll crank quickly to get the slack out, but as soon as I'm starting to come tight on the fish, I'll stop and let the boat do the rest of the work. Um, the purpose of a circle hook is to be swallowed whole, and as it comes out, it rotates and finds the corner of the mouth. And if you're going too quick with what you're doing, especially with these high speed reels now that can be 60 inches of line every time you turn the handle, that hook can come skipping right out and miss the total corner of the mouth, right? So it's very important to slow the process down when you're doing that. It's very important to feed the fish when you're doing it. Now, we have a couple different scenarios for feeding fish. You have your flat line that can pop out, you're going to run over to it, you're going to pick the rod up, and as you're picking the rod up, I've gotten accustomed to, naturally, as the rod's coming out of the rod holder, I'm knocking it in the free spool. <coughs> pick it up, then do it, you know, everything's one motion. Then you want to either point your rod tip straight at the fish, if you're comfortable with the way you're feeding. If you're not comfortable, you can hold it up. If you're not comfortable with holding it up and doing no thumb, instead of letting it skim, you can just lightly tap your thumb, right? You don't want to stop the spool. You just want to tap it and let it keep rotating so it doesn't overrun itself. If you stop it, as soon as you let it go, it's going to overrun. So this is all kind of a finesse thing. You go through your count, lock it up, slowly crank. The other scenario where you're going to get a little more of a buffer, especially as you're practicing and learning, is in the outrigger. Now the importance of this in the outrigger, and I go on other people's boats and I, I let them set their stuff up and see how things go. And a lot of people with their values fish their drag locked up. I fish the drag back off as much as I can have it without line leaking out as we're fishing. Now, the reason why, one, I'm doing stuff for myself, but two, the fish that I'm targeting, again, swallow the bait hole. So if we're getting a bite on the right and I'm helping somebody on the right flat and the left long starts to get bit, that fish can pull on that line and he can grab it with the least amount of resistance that we can afford to have without backlashing. And hopefully he'll give me enough time for somebody on the boat to get to that rod and throw it in the free school. I do, I did fish and in tournaments we fish with no clickers. Usually somebody's holding the rod every, you know, the whole day in the tournament. Charter fishing, I started fishing with no clickers with that mentality, but I quickly switched to fishing with clickers just because I get preoccupied talking with people doing other things or or fishing in grass. I turned around and didn't realize I'm talking to somebody that there's a piece of grass in the line and the drag's so light now I've got all my lines run off my spool. So I, I put clickers on kind of as an indicator for me. Um, but the first thing that I do as we're picking the rod up is the clickers coming off as we're going into free spool. It's kind of all become one natural motion. You can feed a dolphin with the clicker on because it's only about a half a pound of drag. But I would teach yourself to get accustomed to doing it without the clicker. You know, maybe start with the clicker in free spool, get a feel for it with no thumb with the clicker. But you want that line to come off on its own. You don't want the fish pulling it off. So ultimately that's your goal where you want to be for bait fishing. You want the line to come off on its own, in free spool, without backlashing, five or six count, seven count, push up very slow in a couple turns until you come tight and then let the rod just naturally bow up on its own. When we get a bite in the rigger, right, this is where we get a little bit of a buffer if we're paying attention. With the drag backed off, you hear the clicker, eh, eh, you go over and grab it, you're gonna pick the rod up and you're gonna point it right at the cliff, and you're gonna feed it through the cliff. This is where you can really get away with no thumb for practice because the clip is creating a little resistance, right? So it's slowing the process down on the reel. And we call it feeding it through the pin. And you don't want to try to yank it out when he's biting it. You don't want to do anything like that. If your clip tension is set properly, it only should be a couple pounds. When you get the bite, after you feed it through the pin, you lock it up, slowly crank. If the fish is there, the weight of the fish is going to pop it out. 
And then as it falls out, you just kind of turn with it and crank the slack as you're turning and you're tight to the fish, okay? Once we get a fish on with all the schooling fish, we caught seven mahis at once yesterday. We caught eight today at one time. We caught, well, we hooked another five at one time. Um, unfortunately, all those came off. Um, so that does happen, obviously. Uh, and, and it's going to happen more often. You're going to lose five at once more often than you're going to catch eight at once. That's just when things are going, you don't get a perfect feed, things are happening, you know, you're going to, a couple of fish are usually going to come off. Um, but that light drag allows for those extra bites to happen. Um, and we keep the boat going forward uh, until I either deem that we're not going to get another bite or we need to just slow down and stop. We've got enough fish on for the anglers that we have or whatever the case may be. So, when we hook our first fish, um, whether it's a dolphin or a sail, even with blackfin tunas, when we can see them blowing up in the spread, um, I'll continue to fish. A lot of people, the first thing they want to do is apply more drag after five seconds because the line's ripping off the reel. That, that is the worst thing to ever do, in my opinion, fishing. I've never run out of line before, and I've fished some of these lines, some of these reels get down to three or 400 yards of line when we're using them to start with. Fill a fathom up to 500 yards of line. We've never run out of line here before. We've caught blue marlins. We've caught a 97 pound yellowfin tuna on the 20 pound here. Um, never run out, so I've never been in fear of that. But when you're trying to hook multiple fish, which the majority of our fish that we catch here are schooling, kings, wahoos, tunas, mahis, and sails, when you get your first bite, that's the best time to get your second bite and your third bite, right? As long as that fish stays on and keeps the rest of the fish around. If you keep your baits moving for a little bit in maybe the same direction, and then if you feel comfortable, start to learn to slowly make a circle back and continue to fish and make circles around that fish while you have it on, you're going to increase your, your numbers. You're going to go from one fish to two fish, two fish to four fish, and so on. Um, we call it stretching the fish out. So when we look at our first one, whether it's a sail or a mahi, um, if we have other fish in the spread, that first fish is going to get stretched out three or four hundred yards away from the boat while we're trying to hook the other ones. And as that process starts to develop and we get other fish on, then we will turn ourselves back towards the lead fish that we hook, which is the farthest one away, and try to bring everything back together. So it's very important, uh, as with any reel, just like a bike gear, as the diameter of the spool decreases, the drag exponentially increases. On the fish so as more line goes off the reel without you touching the drag the drag exponentially increases on its own on the fish so when we get to points where we're down to 50 yards of line left in a tournament on the reel on the first fish that we stretched out we're literally almost in free spool with the thumb on it to prevent the line from breaking if you're at five pounds at strike in that point there's probably 12 or 15 pounds of the fish and we're only fishing 20 pound line you're far exceeding your breaking point. So we actually back the drag off um, to try to minimize the loss and allow the belly in the line and the stretch in the line to keep the fish on. Any questions up to this point? No? You guys are easy. How far back? How, how, far, far, back? Back, how far back are you running your bait? Yes yeah, sir, so that's a great question. So um, I consider my boat my biggest teaser and the reason why I say that is when I see as a kid growing up fishing in the canals and stuff, and I would see mullets get chased or jacks breaking on the wall or anything like that. Anytime bait was getting chased, offshore flying fish are getting chased, mommy's getting chased by blue marlins, tunas are feeding on stuff. Any, anytime bait exits and re-enters the water, what does it do? It leaves a bubble trail. What does your boat do? Your boat's leaving a bubble trail. So your boat is creating noise and commotion that is, to me, your biggest attractor for fish from a distance. Then the next step is, what do you have in your spread that's gonna help draw them in closer, that final 50 or 100 feet, and then they see your bait and you get your bite. So, as far as our spread is concerned, uh, my, my flat lines typically are fished between 30 and 40 feet behind the boat. My dredge is probably five feet in front of wherever my flat line is. Um, my squid chain is going to be a little further back than my flat line on the right side. I fish it off my right side. Um, then I'm going to have a short rigger right on top of the dredge, which is going to be pretty equidistant, maybe a little further back than my left flat line. Um, and then my long riggers will be back anywhere from 75 to 100 foot. 
everything's pretty close. Yeah, I mean, so you're in your own weight trail. If, uh, your riggers may be out, but the stuff you're running flat off the stern is within your own weight trail. Yes, sir. Yeah, within 30 foot of the yeah. My flat lines are from here to that yeah. point. I think it's fast. Yeah. Pretty close. Like I said, I, I feel like your boat's your biggest teaser. If I was tuna fishing, I would fish stuff a little further back. Uh, if I was specifically targeting tunas, but all of our black fins that we catch this time of year are all around, 90% of our bites are around our dredge. So those fish get locked in on that dredge. If you've ever seen YouTube underwater videos, dredge videos, you'll see tunas darting around it. Once we start to get bites on the flat lines and the short rigger from tunas, we can just sit there and drift baits back as we hook up, because the school's gonna stay with that. So we'll put the boat in slow idle, as slow as it'll go, and you can just drift baits back and continue to try to hook fish. Um, if you have live bait, that's a great time. You know, after you hook a couple, to pull out of gear, pitch some spinning rods out. Um, that's what we did today. We bought some uh, filters from Brian from Store Live Bait to have because we had really good dolphin fishing yesterday. I felt like it would be an opportune time today that if we got covered up again, we could pitch some live filters. So we did that. Uh, we turned our five that we hooked trolling into eight fish on at once with the spinning rods. So that was fun fishing. Um, so, so you can fish your dredge off of a downrigger if you want. Uh, what's that? Okay, dredge is a, a teaser. It's a hookless teaser. It consists of multiple arms like this, spreader bars, or umbrella rays they call it. And what we have here is a, what we call the big over or small. So we have a larger bar on top with a smaller bar on the bottom. These rubber fish are on the inside. Um, and on the outside swivels, we'll put natural bait. Like I'm sorry? How far back? It's going to vary based on sea conditions. You know, on really rough days, when we're fishing and it's 8 to 10 foot or whatever, on a down sea slide, we'll have to put it back 75 or 100 feet and keep it in the water just because the boat surfs a lot in the waves. But most of the time, I would say it's 30 to 40 feet behind the boat. You want it where you can see it uh, at least occasionally, if not more often than not. Um, to see if a fish is following because fish will come and follow it and try to figure out how they want to eat this school of bait or corral it. And your idea, your goal, once that happens and you see that, is to pull it away. And as you're pulling it away, you sink a bait past it like it's stunned and falling out of the school. And that's what we pick our, our sails and our mahis off the teaser with. A little different than a squid chain. Um, we pull a squid chain on the opposite side out of the rigger. This is a very manageable teaser for anybody without an electric reel or a downrigger. You can make up your own. You can buy them pre-made in the tackle stores. And uh, it's just, essentially, it's just a couple rubber squids. Um, I like to fish three on my chain. A lot of the chains come with five or six or seven put together. And then on the very last squid, we have a snap swivel. And I'll fish <clears throat> about 25 to 30 inches of monofilament on this, on the back side of it, 80 pound, and it'll have a chugger head or a sea witch on it, and we'll put a bonita strip or a valley or something like that. So when a fish comes up on the back of it and tugs on this, it gets a taste of something natural. Now, if there's a value on it, you don't floss it and stitch it, you can pull it off pretty easily, especially dolphins or sails. <clears throat> a bonita strip stays on a little better, especially if you salted it, but that gives them a, a little taste of the natural natural bait and that keeps them there close and a lot of times this can be hanging in my rigger like this while we're trolling and the trailer is still in the water and the fish is literally right there within tagging or gap distance because they're so focused on that bait that's on the back trying to transition them off well, how, you could, how far back do you, do you have that bait off that last yes sir so we, uh about 30 to 40 inches 30 inches i usually do an arm's length to the center of my chest gotcha. so whatever that comes to um but this is, this, these linear teasers are great. Um, they create a lot of noise, create a lot of splash on top. You can get them in multiple colors. Easy to pull. You can pull it off of any old reel. You can pull it on a hand line if you want. Just run it through your rigger. You're not going to break your rigger off with it. Um, I pull it on a lever drag reel. The um, reason why I do that is because I keep the drag back off with the clicker on again. That way if something tugs on it and I don't see it, I hear it goes, and I know there's a fish on it. I can have a customer crank it away, or I can crank it away if they want to hook their own fish. They're going to grab the flat line next to it and get ready to present the bait to the fish on the flat line. 
Um, as far as advantages are concerned, something that's beefy like this, that we have bullets on it with three ounce leads, and because of the rubber fish create a little bit of buoyancy and drag, you have to fish a cigar lead in front of it. This setup here, even with 12 bullets on it with three ounce leads, I fish a 48 ounce cigar lead in front of it and keep it in the water at a proper depth and be able to maintain the speed I like to troll, which is anywhere between five and a half and seven knots. Um, so you need something beefy to pull that with. You can't just pull off of a rod tip. You can pull something like this off your cleat. It's a little risky because if you slow down and it sinks and you forget about it, you can run it over, get it in your motors. You don't want to do that. Um, so a downrigger works well for this or an electric reel. We have a, uh, they have dredge booms out now. Tigris, one of my sponsors, makes what's called the side dredge boom. And it's, uh, it's an eight foot pole that I stick out perpendicular to the side of the boat. It has a pulley on it. We create a block and tackle. So you could actually fish this with a manual crank reel if you want on the dredge boom, uh, like a 50 wide or something, where you have your line go through a pulley on the dredge boom. It comes down to the dredge, but there's a pulley in front of the dredge, and then it comes back and it's hard fastened to the boom. So you have a block and tackle now. You can crank this with a, a even a 12 0 center, you can hand crank it in. You don't need a $6,000 electric reel be able to do this. So if you, if you wanted to invest in a dredge boom with a bent butt outfit, you could just put a hefty uh, reel on it. If any of you guys do deep dropping and you have electric reels, you can incorporate your electric. What I do for my deep drop reels is I just take the rod blank off of there when I'm not deep dropping and I put the dredge boom on for sailfish season. When I'm not sail fishing, we get into the springtime, we get into the summertime where we do a lot of live bait, bump trolling and stuff like that. I'll just fish a uh, mylar strip teaser right off my rod tip length. So if I want to go tile fishing or I want to go fish out in the deep with the electric, then I want to come in and fish on the reef. I've got the rod length. I don't need to switch everything out. And I can just put a mylar strip teaser on there, which is a super effective teaser. Uh, it, it's essentially exactly what it is. It's a bar that comes like this. And it's got 12 strips that hang off of it with mylar or holographic fish on it. And they get bit. They get clipped off, they get cut in half. Uh, sales fall them. A lot of the live bait guys use them in the live bait circuit, fishing the tournaments down south. Um, it's a highly effective uh, dredge when we're kite fishing. We'll fish one on the up sea side of our kite spread. Um, and I actually just, I put a water bottle about four or five feet in front of it to keep it floating because we're drifting and it just keeps it up in the water column and it just sits there and rocks in the waves and it just flashes and looks like a school of 100 fish that's with all those strips on there. It's easy to maintain, it's tangle free. If it ever gets tangled, you just hold it up in the wind and it undoes itself, easy to hose off and store. So if you're looking to get into the dredge game and you're not into it yet, that's a cheap investment. You can crank it right off of any rod. Um, you can fish it with no lead when you're bump trolling and then put a cigar lead on it when you're trolling at a regular value speed. Any questions, guys? No? Yeah, I got one. Yes, sir. Is this all uh, monofilament? Is there any braid involved in this trolling? Uh, I fish, uh, that's a great question. So our main line is all monofilament. Um, and the reason why we do that is fishing for stuff like sailfish, where the fastest fish in the ocean, they make tremendous speed bursts, change of directions. Uh, if you don't have stretch in your line, you're looking at losing your fish. Just because the braid can't keep up with it, it's going to part. So we fished the monofilament to allow uh, for stretch and forgiveness for these directional changes. Uh, and it's a lot more forgiving for fish that are jumping, you know, for, for any angler, for fish that are doing a lot of jumping. Um, and when we're fishing multiple lines, five, six lines, you have multiple fish on at a time, and fish gets crossed up, it's a lot easier to get stuff unwrapped with mono than it is with multiple lines with braid. So we do use braid bottom fishing specifically. Um, and I have my spinning rods full with braid because we do bottom fish with the spinning rods a fair amount. Um, and we do catch sails and mahi, our mahis that we bailed today were on the on there with braid, but we also have a 15 foot mono leader on top that helps give a little bit of a buffer. And when we're fishing with the spinning rods <clears throat> for a sail or mahis, we're not trolling and stretching out four or 500 yards of line. We're casting at specific fish and we're either chasing that specific sail down and keeping it within a good a good range to the boat where we 
Most likely aren't losing. We're just chasing around the boat. We see a fish off the surface. We pitch a bait to. We're focused on that fish. This is not something that we're going to hook four or five on the spinning rods at one time with braid. If we were if we were fishing a live bait tournament like we did last year, and we're using spinning rods for the sail fishing, all of them have monotone. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, you've talked about the indication that you have a fish interested in your bait is seeing the line being pulled out. When he, if it's a sail, he hits it, it's a mono. If it's a dolphin, he's gonna come up and mouth it, I guess. Or, so is it the rod action that's gonna be your first indication, or do you actually see the fish? Um, I'll see nine out of 10 of them before we get a bite if I'm paying attention. Can I have your eyes? Well, <laughs> they're going bad, so, but I can still see a fair amount. And, and it's funny that, it's funny because not just seeing the fish, but I can be looking this way, and peripherally I'll see a rod tip bounce different than it should out of the corner of my eye, or I'll even see my rigger halyard do something that it doesn't normally do. Like it just stretches a little more, but it doesn't pop out of the pit and my clicker didn't go, and I, I'll focus on that bait, or I'll focus on that. Anything that comes up abnormal is something to focus in on that bait. So you just want to be aware of your surroundings, just as if you're looking for flying fish or you're looking for birds picking, or you're looking for a piece of float, I always have <clears throat> try to have my charter help me do that because I'm on set of eyes, and I know it's most important for me to focus on the irregularities that come up in the spread because that's usually me we're getting a bite, where people can look out and they can see a bird, they can see a splash from a fish jumping or beating off in the distance, they can find a piece of float, but they may not necessarily see a, a sail tail into the spread, right, Mark? <laughs> we've, we've had, I mean, there's occasions where we'll have had four or five fish in the spread, and I walk in the guys through. You see him, you see him, you want to see him before you do this, and you can't see him. But once you get your eye on it, you see it the first few times, and know what you're looking for, it's very easy to, to pick up on it and see those nuances when they come into the spread. So this is, you know, this is, uh, it's, it's something that uh, just comes with time, obviously. It's tougher to learn these things when you're fishing one day a month. But I think it's equally as important because that day is valuable for you, right? Maybe more valuable than myself is fishing 30 days a month, you know, sometimes. Um, because it's your one day to get out there, go catch some food, go have a good time, uh, and, and be with the family or whatever the case may be. One thing that I think will really help, and I see a lot of guys <clears throat> when I'm trolling around and, and all the seminars that I've done, it's always come up about our the way we fish. And, and one of the things, unless I'm going somewhere, unless I have intentions to go from point A to point B, rarely do I ever drive in a straight line. Uh, I don't use my steering wheel, I use my autopilot. That's pretty much my thing because I'm by myself. So I drive with my autopilot dial all day. So if I, if I make a 30 degree turn and I get a bite in the process of that turn, I know the boat's gonna straighten out while I'm helping the customer, I'm looking to fish. If I did a 30 degree turn, without an autopilot, and then I got busy for a minute, I'm gonna circle back on everything and everything's gonna be a mess and a disaster. So, if you don't have an autopilot, obviously you need to leave somebody at the wheel all the time. But an autopilot for somebody like myself, or if you just fish with yourself and uh, another buddy, is a, is a good investment if you fish it out to where you get used to just driving with your autopilot. And I make, try to make like S turns everywhere I'm going, right? So unless I unless I need to get to something that I see, or I'm just like I haven't had a bite in a while, I want to clear the zone, I want to go in a straight line at seven and a half knots for 15 minutes to a spot um, where I can see my spray good the whole way. Otherwise, I make S turns, and, and the reason why I do that is because change develops bites. So what happens when you make a turn one direction is the stuff on the inside of the turn decelerates, right? What happens? bait decelerates, it's relaxed. What happens when bait accelerates, it's scared. So when you're doing this, stuff's constantly accelerating, decelerating. Your stuff on the inside of your turn is sinking a little bit, swimming under the water. The stuff on the outside is skipping. How many guys have changed the bait from the alley -oo, and as you're putting it out or cranking it in, you get a bite? No one? Okay. So constantly, all the time, and, and this is part of where prospecting comes in, and, Nobody's ever heard of prospecting. Prospecting is something that we do periodically, charter fishing, but it's something that gets done 
eight hours a day during tournaments when we're sail fishing. And it's where two guys stand in the corner of the boat where your flat lines are, they hold those flat line rods, and they crank a bait up to the boat, and they sink it 200 yards, and they crank it up, and as they're cranking it up, the other guy sinks it. So they're going like this the whole entire day, prospecting. And part of it is for fish that are deep, that we can't see from the tower or from the bridge, that maybe you're down below the teachers that we can't see, or maybe low lighting, gray sky, you're looking into the sun, <clears throat> there's a fish on the teaser, and you get picked up, you get a bite, but it's constant change. There are so many times when they're cranking a rigger bait, or cranking a flat line bait in, and a sail, or a mahi, or a tuna, or a wahoo is following that bait in because it's going faster than everything else, right? It's in a hurry, it wants to go somewhere, and all of a sudden you get a bite on the rigger bait as that bait comes by. Why? Because it changed focus on that. That, that fish, created, it was another teaser, right? Even though it was a hook bait, you created a teaser by prospecting it all day long. And at one point you're cranking it up, a fish was following it up and peels off and eats your other bait. So change develops bites. You wanna change the way you drive. Uh, what I normally do is I'll, I'll come up with an idea of where I'd like to fish for the day Usually it's based on the previous day's fishing. Hopefully it's equally as good there. If not, we start to explore. I've got 1,800 waypoints in my machine. We've got a tremendous artificial reef program here in Stewart, Park County, St. Lucie County. You can plug a lot of waypoints in your bottom. A lot of the artificial stuff is what I call high relief. High relief to me is good for holding bait where you normally find pelagics. You're not, you're not gonna find pelagics a lot of times on a rock that's the size of this table that I catch groupers and snappers on, but you're gonna find it on the Francis Langford Memorial Reef, you're gonna find it on the Rankin, you're gonna find it on FPL Reef, you're gonna find it on the stretch of the Wickstrom stuff in 180 foot, you're gonna find it on the Mullifin, you're gonna find it on these, all these areas that are high relief that maybe would hold blue runners, sardines, herrings, and the pelagics would be roaming around. You don't necessarily have to tic-tac right across the top of them because uh, you can get cooted up, you know, or barracudas will bite you and stuff. But you can fish around the perimeter because those fish roam around the perimeter there. So on days where I don't see a surface condition that I like to fish, like an edge that we had today, where we had a color change, current difference, temperature break, I'll play connect the dots all day. I'll go from one spot to another, from 75 foot to 180 foot, back into 130, back out, and then I find a zone where we're getting bites. I'm getting bites at 130 foot today. Now I'm going to work areas that are in 130 foot that are natural and artificial because fish are migrating in that zone. So you can put the pieces of the puzzle together every day. They change every day, but that's part of the fun for me is trying to figure out what those pieces are and be able to put it together and hopefully have a successful day. So stay on top of changing your spread by steering your boat around. When you get bites, try to keep forward momentum so you can hook multiple fish. And if you get comfortable with circling, circle fish, when we get bites, I see a lot of people catch a fish and then they just kind of troll. So let's say you get a bite and you catch a nice dolphin, right? And then all of a sudden you put it in gear and you're facing north and you troll for 15 minutes to the north, but there's two and a half knots of tide. Now you're a mile and a half away from where you got your bite. Now you got to step back against the tide. It's going to take you 40 minutes to get there. So like if I'm trolling east or west and I get a bite, I, if I can, I'll normally turn south into the current and try to keep me as close to the area where I got the bite as I can, right? I want to stay in that area and at least make a couple laps, a couple circles, a couple figure eights, and see if there's a reason why those fish are there. I can't tell you how many times you get a bite from a dolphin, then you make a couple laps, and then you catch a couple bonitas, and you're like, okay, there's, they're all feeding on the same stuff, right? All these fish eat the same things. Then you catch a sail, then you get four dolphin, you know, so it's a good area. You maybe never run over, why they're there, you maybe never part the bait the bait that they're on, but there's a reason they're there. If you don't know that if you just put it in your ear and troll away. So it's advantageous. <clears throat> if you're not familiar with memorizing your Loran TDs when you get a bite or your GPS coordinates when you get a bite, hit the man over overboard button for the day. Save a waypoint, right? And then at the end of the day, delete the waypoints so they don't get confused with the bottom structure that you keep in there and store in there all the time. Uh, you, you don't have to be afraid to hit the man overboard button. I fish with a track line. Hit the mic, sorry. <laughs> it's on the uh, I fish with a track line on so I can pay attention to the track line, where I've gone, what I've done. Uh, and then I can see areas, if I've made four or five circles, 
and caught fish in the morning and I left that area and then I, I forget where it was, but I can look at my track and go, oh, I had good action there in the morning because I made four or five circles and I go back there and sometimes we get a bite again. So it's good to have that memory help from your electronics. It's very simple to do and uh, it, it, it can help with the, uh, the extra portions of the day. Obviously, uh, stuff to look for, guys, for trolling, edges. I, I always tell people fish live on the edges of things, whether a snook living on a seawall or a jack running up and down mangroves or a grouper living on the edge of the reef or a dolphin or a blue marlin or a sail swimming on a, a temperature break and a color change. Fish live on the edges of things and they swim up and down to look for bait. Bait gets gathered on surface conditions because two currents come together, typically different temperature, and microorganisms gather up there, jellyfish float there, grass floats there. Now you've created an environment where fish are going to swim up and down and look for food. <coughs> and you want to fish up and down that. Uh, not all the time is the bluer water and warmer water better fishing. There's a lot of days where the colder, greener water it can be more productive. So don't get caught up in I have to fish in the better water. Fish, in my opinion, especially sailfish, are not common source of the water. They, we, we have caught some sails in some pretty terrible looking water and had some great days um, catching sails. As a matter of fact, the day we caught 40 in the Pelican, we were fishing in 68 degree water and it looked like pea soup. We would, I, we would have never stopped there if the boat that fished the first day of the tournament hadn't gone there and caught 40 or whatever it was. So, um, you know, they, if there's a reason they're there, they'll show you. Usually it's through a bite, you just got to give them that opportunity. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. So I know you have a you have an inboard, right? So is your prop wash a lot shorter than two outboards? It's clean. Uh, yeah, it's clean because my my yeah, it's it's cleaner than outboards. You know, if you have multiple outboards, uh, the guys that I know that troll with three or four outboards usually turn a couple of them off uh, to clean up the wash. Um, you know, if I was pulling a dredge and I had two outboards and I was trolling at six or seven knots, you could rotate your hours on your motor and fish one motor here, one motor there. You know, you don't have to rack up all your hours on one side all day and fish one motor. Um, but again, but would you be further back? Is the problem? What's that? Would you be further back than 30 yards? In the uh, you can. Um, you know, the, like I said to you though, the, the, in my opinion, the, the biggest teaser is, is your boat. Okay. And one of the things about fishing stuff too far back, especially with light tackle, is you can get too far back where when you get a bite and by the time you feed the fish you have so much line out if you're fishing a spread way back that the stretch of the line is not going to allow you to penetrate the hook very effectively so I've, I've we've had scenarios where i was a mate we were i was riding in the tower and we kept trying a sail trying a sail and finally i'm like look you got it you got to tease him back into the boat you got to crank it in you got to give up on the fish and hope he falls back into the spread and we get them close again because we're never going to hook them 200 yards behind the boat. It's just not going to happen. So if I was pulling some feathers, tuna fishing or something like that, or if I was fishing some lures and I was maybe had 30 pound or some, you know, a little stiffer rod and some J hooks and stuff, you could fish some stuff a little further back and have a little higher strike point on your drag, um, but that could work. But we're circle hook fishing, even when I'm J hook fishing at strike, I'm fishing about three and a half pounds of drag. Um, we get up onto the button after we hook the fish, we'll go to about five pounds. If we're chasing the fish down, we'll go to about seven or eight. But once we've gained that slack back up, got the belly out of the line, we go back to about four and a half or five pounds. So it's tough to stuff with a lure or anything like that, you know, far back with that kind of drag on uh, the lighter stuff to do that. Um, like I said, with the stretch, with that amount of line out, when you fish something 100 yards back, and then you feed five or six seconds. You know, at six and a half knots, you're pretty stretched out to be able to have a successful workout. I want to make sure I understand how you rig your flat line. What is, is a flat line anything not in an outrigger, or are you bringing it down to the boat with a rubber band or something? Yeah, so uh, I, I just uh, a lot of the tackle stores sell them. I'm not sure if these guys have them here, but uh, it's just a blacks release clip. Yeah, Same right. thing you would have in your outrigger. Right. They come on a piece of starboard with suction cuffs, so they right. go right on the transom. Okay, so okay. So and you could do that with a rubber band if you wanted, but something <coughs> you some release a, clip. A rubber band would probably not be very effective because I know like a I think a number 64 rubber band breaks at like 18 pounds and a 32 breaks at nine pounds. So I mean a piece of copper wire twisted up and folded over would probably be better. Okay. But you know they I've had 
two sets of these suction cup release clips on my transom in 11 years, which is over 18,000 hours on the water. So they're pretty durable for the 25 bucks you're going to spend on them. You can take them off at the end of the day, put them away. It's clean on your transom. You don't have to worry about screwing anything in there or anything like that. So, and then on the on the uh, this is a good kind of brings up a good point on the <clears throat> on the outriggers because we feed the fish through the pin. And because if you get grass on, you want to skip the, the grass off or whatever, we run our line straight through the outriggers. <clears throat> on the flat lines, where we're close to the teasers, because we fish the drag back off, I twist up the line 10 times and put it in the clip. Lift. The reason why I do that is if we get a fish that comes up on the teaser, I can just walk over, and as I pick the rod up out of the rod holder, with my right hand, and I'm throwing it in a free spool, the rest of the way, or I'm walking you up to crank it up in front of the teaser. As I pick it up, it automatically pops it out of the pink because it's twisted. If it was run straight through and I pick it up, it's just going to pull the bait to me, and I got to do an extra step, lean over, and pop it out manually. So it's a little faster that way, and it also prevents uh, any leak out on your flat line uh, if you fish with no clicker. I, I guess I don't understand on a teaser feeding through the pin. Uh, maybe I'm gonna, maybe I'm just not up to date. I just use a clip on my my rigger. Yes, sir. Rob, the the pin. Uh, when I say the pin is the pin that holds your rigger clip, your rigger clip on a black clip. We just call it a pin. So okay. you're feeding it through the rigger clip is what you're doing. And you're not feeding the fish on the teaser through there. You're feeding the fish on a rigger bait bite. You're feeding the fish on teasers off your flat line because your flat lines are the closest baits. Okay. If you have a fish on your dredge and he's following your dredge. And you're pulling the dredge in and he's following it to the boat your flat line that's closest to the boat needs to be popped out and it needs to be cranked up in front of the dredge because your dredge is coming to the boat gotcha. and what you're going to do is get it 10 or 15 feet in front of the dredge and you're going to throw it in free spool and you're going to let it sink past the dredge as the dredge is coming away so now what you're replicating is a stunned bait fish falling out of their spool and it's a natural thing for a sail to see that the way they feed and falls a bait turn off of it or a body to turn off of it and grab that bait. Once they grab it, you see your line jump and you feel your line jump, you just do your count from there, keep your teaser coming so it's out of the way, and go ahead and push the drag up slowly and crank. With the squid chain, you can get, <clears throat> there's a couple ways you can do it. You can try to get your, your bait up in front of the squid chain to transfer the fish off, but a lot of times their heads are out of the water and they're really focused on that on the surface and it's hard to do. So the best thing to do is to just get it out of the way and have your bait skipping with your rod tip up and then free spool about eight or ten feet behind where the teaser stops coming. And as soon as that teaser's out of the water or out of the way, when they turn around, they eat it going away. And you have your rod tip up and your thumb in free spool so when they bite it, you can drop your tip and buff for the bite. If you have it pointing straight like this, they grab it, and you release your thumb, most likely you're going to backlash. So you want to drop your tip and buff for the bite. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the reefs and the wrecks. Um, do you fish push button hill or have any advice uh, in that area? As far as trolling is concerned? Yeah, trolling. Yeah, I troll out there a little bit. I don't go out there and fish for the black bitunas very much unless we're desperate to do it. Um, just because they're small and I really can't stand to do it. I'd rather go catch something on the bottom if I can in shore. Um, but uh, it's always a good spot to pull planer. We do some high speed trolling early in the morning and stuff. We'll go out here and sit around for a while, certain times of the year. Um, and we do do some bottom fishing out there if the current's not too terrible. But uh, yeah, it, I normally, if I go out there to target the tunas, I'll fish, uh, I'll take the squid skirts, the boot squid skirts or whatever, or Gulf Street makes up. They come in like a five or six pack, and I'll make a daisy chain of three of them with quarter ounce or three eighths ounce leads up inside of them. Some 50 or 60 pound, and just put a hook in the trailing one. Then put three or four of those out and just tool around, and you can catch those little black tips all day long, really, when they're biting the grass isn't bad. It's not a bad spot for there to to pull a big bait on the plane or two, you know, for a while, because wahoos like to feed on those things a lot of times. You can catch some of the bigger fish <coughs> there jigging. Some guys are getting into the slow pitch digging and stuff and seeing some bigger fish down deep below the smaller fish doing that. Uh, but we, we haven't gotten into doing that with customers. So when I, I did jigging a 
few years ago and it lasts about 15 seconds and people are tired. So I, I got rid of the investment in the thousands of dollars of jigs and rods and reels. So uh, it's just the nature of it. It's like the people, oh, I want to catch a shark. You charter to catch a shark in the first 15 minutes is great. And then who gets to catch the shark? Me. Uh, I don't see that anymore. So, uh, all right, we're going to move on from trolling. Uh, we'll talk about some bottom fishing. We do a fair amount of it. Um, there's some excellent bottom fishing to be had here as long as the conditions are right. Uh, conditions are right, meaning no cold water on the bottom. Obviously, clarity of water on the bottom. If we have a big swell from a, a cold front or a nor'easter or a hurricane or a tropical storm or something like that, usually it takes a few days for things to settle. Uh, one of our favorite, one of my favorite types of fishing, especially for people that have done it before, is chicken rig fishing. Um, and a chicken rig essentially is just a multi hook rig on a dropper loop. I usually fish 50 pound meter on those. Um, and I use a, a 3 0 or a 4 0 Mustad Ultra Point J hook. Um, never broken one of these hooks. We've caught 20 plus pound groupers. We've caught 48 pound Kobe on one. We've caught Amber Jacks on them. We've fought sharks remarkably on this 50 pound and uh, these little hooks forever and uh, got them to the boat to cut them off. Two 300 pound sharks. <clears throat> so the stuff holds up. And we'll fish uh, depending on the area. And that's just going to come with time for you to learn what's there. Uh, I will change areas as to whether I want to fish a cut bait at that spot or I want to fish a piece of squid. Uh, like trigger fish, small pieces of squid, vermilion snappers, even for the three and four and five pound vermilions, a small piece of squid works great. Trigger fish, a really small piece of squid works great. Even a, a small strip of it, an inch and a half or two inches long of this hook. We get into red groupers and stuff, uh, scamp groupers, a whole squid works well, or if you have some of the jumbo squids, using the whole head works really well. Um, and like some of the bigger lane snappers and stuff that we catch uh, that are in the two to three or four pound range. I like to use cut bait for those. Uh, one of the favorite cut baits would be herring or goggle eye. When we have them left over, they die throughout the day for my bait fishing. I'll save them. We'll cut them up. Specifically on the herrings, it holds up really well. Uh, they've got a really uh, tough spot on their belly crease. So I hook, I hook the meat through the belly, so I'll cut the head and tail off and cut the herring in three or four spots, more so the ventral, and hook them at the belly side in the center. And that can get pulled on and tugged on and bit and nipped and everything by every small creature in the ocean until you feel that single or double thud. And that's when you want to set your hook when you're, when you're targeting the bigger snappers and stuff. Um, the, the small stuff's going to come in there and peck, peck, peck away at the meat. It's going to be... I tell people, wait through the vibration bites. You can see the rods, it's like, duh, 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 you know, and they, then all of a sudden you get the doo, the doo, you get the bigger bites. And then when you get those bigger bites, you can react and set your hook with that. This is the only method that we use for bottom fishing where we set our hook, and that's because our hooks are above our lead. When we uh, are live bait bottom fishing for groupers or snappers or cobias or whatever, we use a three way swivel like we have here, um, and we just tie. Uh, an 8 or 10 inch piece of mono on the bottom, part of the swivel, usually 50 or 80 pound depending on where we're fishing, but it's always lighter than my leader. That way if we hook a fish with the lead stuck in the bottom, hopefully the lead will break off and we can still catch the fish. And then depending on current, uh, we'll fish anywhere from say 6 to 15 foot a leader. Uh, and, and, and the leader will vary from 80 to 130 pound. Uh, based on the current in the area that we're fishing. And we use a variety of live baits. Uh, we use a uh, BMC Nemesis circle hook. It's a red offset circle hook. We usually use it in an 8 0 or a 10 0. The 10 0 we use on uh, like blue runners and uh, big pinfish, big runts, uh, small snappers that we catch while we're bait fishing. Um, and then the uh, the Adas we'll typically use on a sardine or a herring or a cigar minnow. So all the uh, the scale bait will look sideways through the nose, or if there's no curve, we'll look through the tail on the bottom side between the ankle fin and the tail. All the big baits will go up through the bottom lip and out the top of the center. And unless there's no current, then we'll hook them in the tail as well. 
uh, when there's minimal in our current, look at the bait in the tail, it's going to give it a lot more action. They're trying to drag that lead away and they're just sitting there going, do, 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 trying to pull that lead around on the bottom. So they're sending out a lot more vibration. Uh, you get a lot of a good, good response on your bikes for that. <clears throat> but if there's a three quarters of a knot or a knot of current or more, uh, it's difficult to do that, uh, especially if your power fishing are anchored up because the bait will trail or you're, you're pulling it backwards and now it doesn't look natural. So if you've got wind against the tide and you're kind of sitting still or you got minimal current, you set a half knot, three quarters of a knot or less, and you can do that to slow your drift down where that bait's able to work really hard but not look unnatural like it's getting pulled backwards. Uh, you get a lot of very effective bites with that. The biggest thing about the live bait bite, yes sir? What, what depth are you looking at here? And they said, what kind of weight are we using typically? Okay, so our weight varies. I've got about 300 pounds of lead on the boat, ranging from six ounces to 32 ounces, and that's gonna change every day based on current. There's days where we've used 24 ounces of lead in 70 foot of water. And there's days where I've used 10 ounces in 300 foot of water. So our lead's gonna vary. The nice thing about this setup here is with bank sinkers, depending on when you get to your spot, you make a drift and see where your speed over the ground is on your GPS after you took your forward momentum away. <clears throat> Usually I arrive at a spot, pull the boat out of gear, I'll get my rods out, I'll undo my leaders off the rod, I'll talk to my people about what to do when we get a bite, and I'll, I'll tell you about that right now. <coughs> Is when we, uh, I tell people, we'll put a bait on, we'll throw it in the water, pick your rod up, free spool, lead down, go all the way to the bottom, you hit the bottom, lock it all the way up. I like you to have your rod tip above eye level, right? Then your hand on the handle, rod in your left hip, left hand above the reel for leverage. If your bait starts to get nervous, you can slowly crank down and lift your lead away from the bottom and pull your bait away from the bottom. And that gives you a little bit of an advantage if you're off the bottom for the bite. If you don't feel that, you wanna be ready you know, you can just get an insta bite where you get yanked and pulled down. But the first thing you want to do when you get a bite is to start cranking. You don't want to set the hook. The reason why you don't want to set the hook is your lead is between you and the bait. So your leg can be on the bottom and your bait can be straight back up at the boat. And the way the swivel is designed, you can feel the bite. But what's the first thing that happens if you yank on the lead? You just pull it straight up towards your fish. So you're not really driving the hook home or anything like that. So the best way to set the hook with the live bait on the bottom is to crank and eliminate the angle that the leg creates between you and the fish. And then once you're tight, then pump up, crank down, pump up, crank down. So I go through that whole speech, it's about a minute, and a half. I'll turn and look at my GPS and see what the speed over the ground is. And then my determination will be based on just sheer number of days and experience. If I'm at 150 foot of water and I got a knot and a half of tide, I'm probably gonna have to use 12 ounces of lead. If I'm in 220 foot of water and I got a knot and a half, I'm probably going to want to use 14 or 16 ounces of lead to help me get down quick enough and, uh, and to deal with that. Now, I power fish with all the fishing I do. What I mean by that is I step the tide with the boat to slow the drift down. I don't drift water bottom fishing with any kind of current like that. So I'll let people deploy. I'll get south of my numbers. I'll let people deploy. And I'll just slow the boat down as we skip to the north. So you should feel your lead skipping on the bottom with the boat. If you have too much lead, your lead will get in front of the boat and it'll snag. If you have too little of lead, when I'm on the forward, you're gonna come off the bottom. So the right amount of lead, you should see your rod tip bouncing and skipping along the whole entire time. If it slowly starts to load up, and I can see this with people bottom fishing, they say, hey, you're stuck in the bottom. Oh, no, yeah, you're stuck in the bottom. Because I can just see your rod stop bouncing and it's got a little bit of a camper to it. I know that it's loading up. So you wanna just start popping it like this. Usually you can pop the lid out of the bottom and then let it start to sink. If you don't feel comfortable or you get snagged a lot, depending on your area, there are areas that I've learned that are really, really treacherous. So we'll hit the bottom and crank it up a couple feet and just give, us, give ourselves that advantage. Obviously, if you fish wrecks a lot, you know, fishing on the outer edges of the wrecks and not across the top of it is more effective because you'll snag. Um, and the fish live on the river. A lot of the, a lot of the jacks and cobias live on the top. And if that's the case, you're marking that. You don't need to go all the way to the bottom. You're not going to risk getting snagged. But if you're trying to catch a grouper or a snapper around a wreck, and you're not able to anchor, fishing around the perimeter of it is better than trying to go right across the top of it. Because something that has 20 or 30 or 40 foot of relief 
when you hit the bottom south of it, you're moving north, it's hard to determine where your lead is in relation to the towers and everything that's on that boat without getting snagged. So I, I would tell you that if you're going to go fishing, bottom fishing, want to invest in a variety of leads if you're going to spend the whole day doing it. So you can adapt to each changing condition. I, there's days where I've started at 110 foot, used 30 ounces of lead, and by the end of the day I've used six ounces. There's days where I've started and I've had south tide in the morning, and I've had north tide in the afternoon. And there's days where you have north current on the top and south current on the bottom. So there's a lot of variables to take into consideration. You'll learn that through time. Uh, one of the biggest things if you're marking a lot of stuff and you're not getting bites, you think you should be getting bites, the first thing I always do is instinctively grab the leads. If the leads are chilly or ice cold or five baits are dying on the first drop, it's a pretty good chance you're going to have a hard time getting a bite. There's a thermal client on the bottom. It usually means the bottom's dirty on the bottom, uh, maybe murky. There's something going on down there, it's going to be hard to get a bite. When we have south tide, traditionally it can be hard to get a bite. Now, the first day of south tide, the second day of south tide can be very prolific at times, but historically speaking, over a long period of time, it's very cool. After we get a big blow or we get a swell that's really, really sandy, we see a lot of what we call puppy dog sharks or the Atlantic sharp nose come in, and they're really a pain, pain in the butt. Once they start to thin out, though, the, the, the bottom fishing starts to get real good again. The clarity of the water is clean. Any questions? Um, uh, fish finder rig, Slide, <coughs> sliding sinker, you don't use it? No, sir. Why? Uh, just because I change leads and change areas so much. If anybody's ever seen me out there fishing, my boat's off plane more times than it's trolling. <laughs> well, especially when we're fishing, there's days where I'll cover 75, 80 miles. If I had a fish finder rig and I went from 70 foot to 90 foot, 90 foot to 200 foot to back into 150 trying to find an area where we're going to get a bite, I've got four different current scenarios. I've had to retie four times, three rods. Different so, weights. Yeah. Okay, so this so, gives you the flexibility to change weights as needed based upon current. Correct. Yeah. And even when we're mutton fishing, I still fish, uh, uh, well, if the sharks and goliaths are bad, we'll fish a, a bank sinker and a spro swivel with a rubber band where when we get the bite and we get the lead to the top, we can break the rubber band while the angler is cranking and the lead will slide down from the fish so you can just crank it up and you don't have to handline it. If we don't have any issues with that, I personally enjoy handlining buttons and stuff like that. So I'll fish my 30 to 50 foot leader off the three-way swivel. The lead will, I tell my anglers to leave me on the rod over. They start cranking on the fish on the rod over. When the lead hits the surface, I grab it and swing it to them. They grab it and I'm already pulling like this. So uh, if we get bit off or Goliath or a shark, you know, we'll try the sliding lead. That's a problem. Too. But that's the, the only time I anchor is for bucket anchor fishing. Otherwise, we power fish or we'll drift for cobias. That's the only time I really drift is drifting for cobias. Um, any other questions? No. All right. As far as uh, all the spin rods concerned, we had we just had this rigged up today. All my guys were left-handed, so yes, it looks backwards because it is backwards. First time I've had three left-handed people in the boat at once. But uh, it was awkward for me because I kept going like this. There's no handles. But um, when I, I take the same spinning reel with me uh, and rod. So I've, I've, I've used a Slammer 6500. I've used the 6500 series for everything that I use for offshore all the way through every series that I've used with head. Now we're up with using the Slammer 3. Uh, I spooled with 65 pound braid. It's a top shot of braid, so there's mono underneath, so when the braid goes bad, I can just change the top shot. I don't have to change the whole entire spool. And then I'll, I'll typically keep anywhere, like with the sales on, he's around now, I'll, I'll keep a 15 or 18 foot, 40 pound leader on here. So if we can pitch to a sail or pitch to mahis and they're swallowing the bait and I gotta cut them off. I don't have to retie my leader to line knot more often. I can just trip this back six inches fifteen times and then I get down to a four foot leader and then it's time to retie. So it allows me the leeway to get through the day. But we'll start out in the morning, snap swivel, Subiki rig, go catch bait. If it's cobia season we'll use the Gulf Street Cobia Slayers. 
I'll put that on. I've got a, I'll use a, about a three foot leader, uh, typically a 50 pound, and go right to the swivel. I leave my swivels off just because I do a lot of changing. Uh, obviously, it's uh, when we're bailing dolphins, we get rid of the swivel. But when we're going from bottom fishing to cobia fishing to bait fishing throughout the course of the day, I leave a snap swivel on. Like we we'll use the chicken rigs on here a lot of times. The current's light, it's a lot of fun. <coughs> Uh, all of a sudden, we crank up a vermilion snapper and four cobias follow it up. I can unsnap it, put a cobia jig on right away, catch the cobia, and then we can go back. Uh, during the spring time, you know, we're chicken rig fishing, and a lot of times we'll have dolphins swim up on us, so I have to snap swim on there. I'll have some short leaders made up, three or four foot long, with jay hooks on it to where I can just put them on that. Put a piece of spin, like a frozen spin in the water first to keep them around. That is one thing if you guys do go out fishing, uh, I, for those of you who see me around, if you want running or trolling, uh, I, I'll typically leave my riggers out uh, when there's a lot of bodies around with things hanging uh, in, in the uh, outriggers. And I can't tell you how many times we've been gone fishing and I leave the drag back off when we slow down and we stop and the baits are just dangling in the riggers and bodies come up and grab, grab them. And we're in preschool with the clicker or light drag with the clicker. And uh, they pull that, they hook it, and they catch it. The other advantage to leaving it, if I'm running from spot to spot, I see some valley or values or flying fish get showered, I see a bird picking. I don't have to go into my cooler, put the bait on, put it out. I can literally run right to what I'm seeing, a free jumping sail, a uh, free jumping body, whatever the case may be, run right to it as I'm slowing down, put it over the free school. I have two baits out in a matter of seconds to try to take advantage of the situation where you weren't even fishing, you just saw an opportunity when you were prepared for it. That's uh, <clears throat> that's one of the biggest advantages to having the spinning rod on the boat, is to be prepared for opportunities. Like I said, uh, how many days we see leatherback turtle, turtles or man rays swimming around, and we have a cobia jig ready to go, and we can catch or cast, and uh, hopefully catch a cobia on one of those. Um, so, Super versatile uh, reel. It's paired with a Carnage 2 series rod. Uh, like I said, we use it for everything from catching bait to cobia jig fishing, uh, either vertically on the wrecks with the golf stick cobia slayers or casting at turtles and stuff, through chicken rig fishing, live bait, bailing dolphins, bailing sails during the summertime. Uh, so, highly effective to have that ready and prepared for, uh, for anything that can be thrown at you. You definitely want to have a scenarios. Um, it's always good to carry squid on the boat, I feel like, uh, even when you're trolling. Um, you know, if you're trolling slow, you can always go catch something on the bottom, typically for dinner, whether it's sea bass, trigger fish, or, or lane snappers, or whatever, for dinner, to kind of save the day. And there's a lot of days that uh, bottom fishing has saved the day for people that have chartered us that wanted to specifically catch a good agents, and it just wasn't happening. I can't stand it to sit there all day and not have bites and do the same thing all day. I just, my ADHD, high definition, catches up with me, so I gotta try something else. And uh, the bottom fishing obviously can be very active at times. And it's great for kids. If you got kids of your own or grandkids or whatever, uh, you can catch two or three species at a time. And like I said, you can catch fish that are great eating, that are 12 inches long, or you can catch something that's 20 pounds. So, you got the rod in your hand, you're feeling the bite, you're setting the hook. So, it's an exciting way to go fishing. And it's, it's very simple to get started with. You know, it's cheap to get started with, the hooks and the tackle. Obviously, you're not going to fish a 30 ounce lead on your spinning rod. So, if the conditions have got to be good, you probably want to fish 12 ounces or less. Um, and uh, fishing anywhere from, say, 60 to 115 foot of water on the six mile reef is a great spot. A lot of red groupers on there, a lot of big lake snappers, a lot of the artificial stuff around the tetrahedrons is great um, for the big lake snappers. Um, so, great way to uh, have a day and have a fish fry. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you, do you use radar at all for locating birds and stuff? Uh, <coughs> you know, when I went to the fishing, we did. I, I don't use it here locally. Uh, I was having a conversation with this gentleman earlier. I, I probably spent 95% of my time inside a 200 foot of water. <coughs> Even when we're trolling, you know, everybody wants to race out to a thousand foot or you know, 
you know, like, I gotta go to the golf street. Chargers ask all the time, we in the golf street, we in the golf street. But I would say 90% of my fishing is done inside the golf street for all the sales team, a lot of these students. Um, not to say that we don't find ourselves in six or 900 foot of water certain times of the year or certain days just because conditions force us to and we can have good fishing. But uh, to me, fishing around the structure inshore, connecting the dots, looking for those surface conditions inshore is much more valuable than looking for an edge that's not always there in the Gulf Stream and getting out of that vast deep water and, and hoping for you know, a monumental light, which just doesn't always happen. And you do occasionally find a piece of float out there that's been unmolested, but man, a piece of float's got to come from a serious continent from Miami up through here now and have fish on it. So just keep that in mind. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of great fishing that gets worked by. Our best fishing this spring in May. Uh, we had 10 days of great gaffer fishing, and, and I caught our biggest dolphins three quarters of a mile north of the pipe barge in 50 foot of water. We had one day we caught 18, and I think we had five fish over 30 pounds. So there was just a bunch of flyers and frigates, and there was pretty water in there, and everybody was zipping by. I thought for sure there was going to be 100 boats in there fishing with us, and called a few of the other charter boats on the phone, and they came in there, and everybody had great fishing. So it's, and it was good like that for. A solid six days, five or six days up in the shore. Yeah. Keep in mind, look, look when you're running. Yes, sir. Um, you've talked about the structure that's out here. I'm new to the area, so I don't know the reefs. You got a chart, or is there a website? Is there yeah, a there's county, uh, county website? Martin County Artificial Reef. There's a, there's a couple websites you can just okay. Google. Uh, do, you, uh, do you have charts in here? Yeah, they've got charts in here too. You can put flat long, you can plug it, just take a day and learn your machine, plug your stuff in. What's that? Got all the reefs and everything on there. So you can go plug it in, then go connect the dots. Some of them are not 100% accurate. It's just the nature of it. Like they go to sink a tug somewhere, and this is what we started, and then current, and something slipped, and then it's, it's you know, a couple microseconds off. So you get a general area. Even on, even on the newest, latest, and greatest electronics, they come with stuff already on there, right? Where the chip does, and this stuff's not there. But you get in that area and do some trolling and some figure eights and find it, then you need your new waypoints to save it in that area. You know exactly where it's at. And, so the key, ahead. the key here is the structure. Uh, I would say it's a big part of it, but no, surface conditions are huge. But okay. you, I, you can go out ten days in a row and never see a surface condition. Right. So then what do you? Do? So today we came out and there was a beautiful reverse edge at the 70 foot. And what I mean by that was the blue water was on the west, west side and the green water was on the east side. It was ripped up, it was a degree change. I mean, the better fishing was in the green water on the east side. There was flyers and birds everywhere. And then you got to another edge at 150 foot that had more north current and it was rougher. It was just a current edge with no grass and it was blue water again. And that's where a few sails were caught. So but you can go tomorrow and it'd be flat calm and you not see a single condition anywhere. But there's a lot of days you go and you don't see any conditions. So if you don't see a condition, you want your backup to it. To me, it's fish structure. And that's why I spend a lot of my time in shore. Because if I run off, way offshore, and I don't see a condition or find a piece of float, now what do I do? I just burn two hours of my time. I don't care about the fuel because if I have to run 30 miles to go catch fish, I'll do it. I'd rather spend an hour in a good spot fishing than five hours in bad one. So if I have to run somewhere to do it, I burn a ton of fuel all the time running around bottom fishing and stuff. And that's part of it because there's a lot of days you go and it just all comes together and you don't burn anything. So it works its way out. But to run out there without a game plan other than find a piece of float or find a piece of grass that's not there and get out to 600,000, 1,200 foot and find nothing, and come back in. Now it's 12 o'clock, and you don't know what's being caught in shore. You're behind the eight ball there, and now it's two o'clock. So I've got a bite. I'm we'll trying to bottom. You don't know the condition. So when I troll in shore along bottom spots, I'm constantly looking not only for bait, but I'm looking at the bottom and seeing what I'm marking. So when I do decide to go bottom fishing, I can run to that spot, you know, later and say, oh, I know I mark stuff here. If I'm going there, I'm just guessing. I'll throw it a dart at my dartboard and hoping that there's something there when I get there. I, I 
control over, look, make a mental note, this look really good, come back here, this look really good, come back here, so nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, I'm not going to go there. Right? So you try to maximize your time. And that's about it, guys. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We were out today. We didn't catch shit. You were out. <laughs> you were out today. You caught the old